What's up, NBA fan? What's up, all sports fan? This your boy, JB, host of the Behind the Bench Podcast Network and channel, giving a shout out to the rest of the crew, Shy, Kevin, Jermaine, KB Film Room, Big Dog Talk Sports. That's right. That's right. For everyone who's tuning in, we thank you for supporting Behind the Bench and subscribing to the channel, helping to make the show the best that it can be. Hey, I want to share this. I want to share this with the audience. It's something I came across earlier today. And basically, how the tables have turned within a year's time. See, when you're a fan of a team, you know your team. You know your team. Instincts, intuition, gut feeling, worrythal, total recall. <laughs> and as I always say, over these past six years, the output has been greater than the input. The talent that was exported out was greater than the talent that they keep trying to import in. See, when it comes to this situation, and like I said, I think everybody knows who supports the channel and come across um, the videos that I've been able to do that I'm a fan of Los Angeles Lakers. And like I said, you know, uh, when football season starts, it kicks off, we're going to be talking football, uh, baseball. We know baseball is underway. Although I think baseball is kind of having a, uh, oh man, it's just something strange going on with baseball right now. I can't really put my finger on it. Maybe it has something to do with some of the rule changes that have, uh, been implemented to try to uh, speed up the game and whatnot, you know. But I will be talking baseball uh, at some point. And like I said, football is about to uh, ramp up. Training camp, preseason, the Hall of Fame game uh, will be uh, played in August. So don't worry, we'll be talking more than just basketball. But... the output has been greater than the input and just 365 days ago 300 well actually <laughs> let's just say a year ago and about three weeks later after the fact the pronosticators the experts the talking heads the insiders they all said that the Lakers won free agency unequivocally. That the Lakers brought in more young talent than any other team during the offseason. That the Lakers had the deepest roster of anybody in the league heading into this recent season. They were predicted to advance to the finals this year and play for the championship. Right? They said... They team improved to such a degree that they would overthrow and beat Denver come playoff time. But see, you can't masquerade your way to the top. And this is not to talk bad of the players who they brought up in here during free agency last year or last offseason and that midseason trade uh during the 22-23 campaign that uh where the Lakers acquired D'Angelo Russell, Rui Huchimura, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, right? And then Mo Bamba at the time. So they had this offseason where the players who they acquired, most of them they did resign. They lost Malik Beasley to a free agency as well as Mobama. 
but the players they wanted to retain that they resigned. And then they signed a multitude of players doing free agency. Gabe Vincent, three years, $30 million. Well, let's, let, let's go back. Let's go back. D Lo uh, re signed for two years with, with a player opt in the uh, uh, year two. Austin Reeves, uh, who I'm a fan of, uh, to be an undrafted player, he is definitely maximizing his ability out there on the court. They re signed him for three years. Jared Vanderbilt, four years, $48 million. And then uh, they brought on Gabe Vincent, three years, $30 million. They signed a, a Cam Reddish, I believe, to a two-year deal with a player, with a, 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 a opt-in. They signed Jackson Hayes for two years. They signed Torian Prince for a year, which he recently uh, uh, signed with the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, they brought in Christian Woods, I believe, for two years, right? And uh, who else did they sign along with that? And then midseason, they brought in Spencer Dinwiddie, right? They brought it. They brought in a, a a whole slew of young players. But after what transpired, now we get this report that says Lakers role players such as D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, Gabe Vincent, and Ru Huchimura have sunk where between neutral to negative trade value across the league. This is far from ideal. Wow. They say how the mighty have fallen. Something was greatly over-exaggerated. The assessment was extreme, to say the least. And they did this trying to convince fans that they just formulated a new young core that on average were about 23, 24 years old, right? And <laughs> fans were convinced that this pseudo young core was better than the original young core. And as I said in the recent video I did a couple of days ago, the whole problem with the franchise is that they have not been able to fill the void of the original young core. I know that is not a popular position to take. And I know it may be difficult. I know on face value, it seems crazy to say that when, when they have two superstars on the team. Anthony Davis, LeBron James, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, however you want to say it, right? But you know something's wrong when one, Two superstars, they, they said, you know, one is supposed to be the GOAT, the greatest basketball player ever. <laughs> and the other, the other guy's a generational talent, right? Those two players should be able to win 50 games in their sleep. It don't even matter who the head coach is. Shouldn't even matter. In their sleep, they should win 50 games. They, can't, they cannot win 50 games. That behooves me. I've never seen nothing like that before. Where you got two bona fide superstars that's supposed to be top 10 players. That's what they tell us. They can't win 50 games. Why do fans think they have to constantly change this roster up every year? You know? Uh, and the answer is think about what people say the Lakers always need. We were told that we had all the depth in the world after they made these signings. But doesn't it feel like we don't have any depth? <laughs> they always say on a yearly basis, we need a big man who can protect the rim, a center who can protect the rim. They need point guard play. And they need, they need perimeter play, 3 and D wings. Well, they had all that naturally before all this started. They had it all naturally. They had it all right there in the palm of their hands. But And I get it. I get it. Most fans would be led to believe that 
that was never true. That's not the case. The franchise sold itself short. I'm just going to give you a, a quick synopsis. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. All the players that they brought up in here to serve as a like a reserve, like a six man level player from Carmelo Anthony. Not saying career wise, we know we know who Carmelo Anthony was in his prime. We know that, but when he was brought to the Lakers two years ago, well three seasons ago, he was asked to play the six man role. When Malik Monk was brought to the Lakers three years ago, he was asked to play under this similar role. They signed uh, four seasons ago uh, for the 2020-21 season, they signed the reigning sixth man of the year, Montrez Hurl, and the runner-up to the sixth man, Dennis Schroeder. And when you look at their point-per-game average, for the Lakers, as six men, none of them who I just listed, who I just mentioned, average more in that role than Jordan Clarkson. Before Jordan Clarkson was traded, he was having his best season. He was averaging around close to 16 points a game. And he went on. Three seasons later, as soon as he was traded to a good team, a good situation in Utah, he became the best six man in the world. That's what he was projected to be, that type of player when he was drafted. So he reached his expectation and benchmark as a player, a six man of the year. There hasn't been one player who they, uh, Lonnie Walker, when they uh, signed him a couple years, two years ago, there hasn't been a player who they brought in to be six men that is average as much as Jordan Clarkson. Not only that, but there's been a couple of seasons uh, with Utah where he's averaged 20 points a game. They haven't had a center. Now, remember, they said that Jackson Hayes, and, and it's nothing against these guys. This ain't about... This is not about attacking them. It's about proving that the output has always been greater than the input. They said, oh, man, the Lakers found their answer at the big, you know, at the center spot, Jackson Hayes and Christian Wood. That's what they told us, right? They said they, they had that on lock, the center position. They haven't established a center who can play full starters minutes who could protect the rim, rebound, and score with his back to the basket, playing 32 to 35 minutes a game. They have not found it. Look at all the sins who they brought up in here. Dwight Howard for a second and third run with the team. Mark Gasol, Tyson Chandler. I'm talking about as starters, Andre Drummond. They played a, a undersized Wayman Gabriel at the five. Heck, they a couple of games during the 21-22 season, they played LeBron James at the five. They played Carmelo Anthony at the five. DeAndre Jordan. Mo Bamba. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the brother's name? Uh, uh, Damian Jones. They haven't established that position since they traded Avica Zubats to the Clippers. I got the numbers. I got the metrics. I got the statistics. I got the proof. That's what you call selling yourself short. That's what you call devaluing your franchise. When you border off your own talent to try to bring in so-called greater talent, Normally, when you build a team up and when you try to improve, 
historically, look at all the long-standing teams. The long-standing teams that had extended runs, they mainly did it and accomplished that through drafted players. Here goes a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Chicago Bulls, right? They drafted Charles Oakley uh, during Michael Jordan's uh, second year with the team in the NBA, right? He was, he was a darn good player, man. He was an enforcer. Great rebounder, right? But yet, they brought in a younger player in Horace Grant two years down the road who they felt was more equipped to solidify that position long term. Right? So they brought in a younger player to re replace a, a player who was a little older. And I'm not even saying Charles Oakley was old because he wasn't. But I'm just saying that's normally how a team operated and function. Right? Well, because of this dude on the team, they operating in reverse. They're trying to bring in veteran players to establish young talent starting out, growing, and developing. When you have a, a, a situation where you're operating in reverse, well, you know what's going to happen? A void is going to be created and overwhelm the dynamic of the team. You see what I'm saying? So what looks good by bringing in veteran uh, talent that when you feel you can make an immediate run for a championship, well, that formula is now outdated and is phased out because most of those veteran players or aged, out of the league, or just retired. Because the youth has taken over, and particularly in the Western Conference. And this is why I keep holding on to this. And I know I, I know it may sound repetitive, redundant. It may get old, but this is very vital because this is about an extreme situation in professional sports that we've ever witnessed, particularly in the NBA. We've never seen an NBA team go this route for this long period of time. Because remember, when they brought that dude to the team in 2018, they signed him to a four-year deal. So really, since they brought him to the team, his association should have ended in 2022. But they keep being led to try to continue extending it because the future has already been mortgaged off six times over so that's why they had to emphasize the young players who they brought in this past offseason so because of the player turn turnover the the uh extreme nature of it over the past previous three years when they re-signed these players and brought these additional uh free agents on board signing two-year deals well fans led to believe oh man we have continuity now we don't have the player turnover now we're stable. We have our future. We, we have our young players for the future. Well, as I said, you cannot masquerade in this game. And a year later, see, with the real young core, they weren't saying it about the real young core. They weren't saying that the real young core had negative, quote, unquote, trade value or just value as a whole because that was the real team. That's my point. The difference is, this pseudo young core is 24, 25 years, we'll say 24, 25 years old. The real young core was just starting out average age 19, 20. So, like I said, if you compare Vanderbilt to Randall, there is no comparison. If you compare, I'm not going to count D'Angelo Russell because he's an original drafted player by the Lakers. If you compare Gabe Vincent to Lonzo Ball, Technically, there, there, there's there's no comparison. If you compare Rui Huchimura to Kyle Kuzma, there's no comparison. Kuzma, when Huchimura was still in Washington, when Kuzma was traded to the Wizards, well, the coaching staff, the team, replaced Rui with Kuzma to start at the three. So that means to, for, for him to just join that team, 
And to be given that starting role, that shows you who the better player is. See, if you break it down, player for player, there, there, there's no comparison. Uh, Torian Prince, he's solid. He's solid. But does he bring you greater intangibles than a Josh Hart? The way Josh Hart performed in the playoffs uh, 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 this postseason? Averaging 12 and a half rebounds a game, the, the second greatest uh, rebounding per game average in the postseason in the past 60 years, the second greatest average ever by a player that's six feet four or, or, or shorter. There's no comparison. The output is greater than the input. So all that esteem, all the expectation placed on this this this, this uh this year's Lakers team, this this uh that just ended, it all dissipated at the snap of a finger because it wasn't tangible, because it wasn't real. It wasn't real. So now we read back where we started from, and this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. And, and when I when I when I mention that young core. I always say foundation, not the end all be all. I'm not saying anybody is going to be a GOAT potential because you can't predict that. It has to be proven over a period of time. I'm talking about it legit means, not through manipulation. What I'm saying is when you draft that deep the way the Lakers did between 24 and 2018, we've never seen nothing like that. And I've been watching NBA for decades. I've never seen a franchise draft that deep the way they did over that four-year period. Within uh, one uh, uh, draft class, they brought in four new players at the same time in the same draft. Boy, man, I've never seen that before. I was like, whoa, wait a minute, man. This this is some new this is some new gear right here. This, this revolutionary was going on. So what I'm trying to say is, when I mentioned that young core, it's, that was the, especially as, as I mentioned in the previous video, when the legendary uh, Kobe Bean Bryant, the Mamba, when he when he hung it up and played his last game and retired, okay, that amazing chapter to to the Lakers book of history was closed and a new chapter was about to start. The foundation and how you build that foundation is going to, to, to determine how your future is going to evolve. See, the future for the franchise in record time has not evolved. It has devolved. That's why we got this flux. That's, and, and, and as a result, free agents across the league, they see the situation is going on and they're not coming here. They're, they're not going to come, they're not going to sign with the Lakers at this particular time. And it's not because of the front office either. I let people, I let, I let the, the, the audience figure that one out. That young core was the most vital, important element to this franchise moving forward. Period. Think about it. When you start over, when you start all over again, the most important element is who you drafting and bringing in then once you get the point a to point b establish the foundation okay then you say okay what, what improvements do we need okay we can make a key trade here or, or free agency we we prime ourselves position ourselves we built this young core up to, to you know go for the home run and get this get the right star free agent that's not gonna come up in here and gouge out the whole franchise and i'm telling you if they would have saw and, and, and continue building on what they had, this franchise would be in much better shape. It wouldn't be all this talk about the Laker front office is, is, is trash or this is a trash organization or they don't, the front office, the GM or the owner, they don't know what they're doing and all this stuff. None of that conversation would be taking place. It would be the total reversal. It would be like, man, how the Lakers doing this? How they pulling this off within the structure of the system of the CBA? It was all predicated on draft, who they drafting it during that drafting phase. That would have been the uh, foundational source. And by the time you got the foundation set, 
Well, you and Cruz control at that point, and you can pick and choose who you want instead of trying to whoever's you know uh, whoever becomes a free agent at that moment. Well, we're gonna try to get this guy. Now nah, you're gonna get the cream of the crop. You're gonna get the cream of the crop. So, in closing, like I said, this is not an attack on who they brought up in here over the past year. It's it's, it's showing and proving when you do the comparisons that the output has been greater than the input every time and and, and 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 over these past six years i've measured the output versus the input and the output continuously wins out what i'm trying to say is let's look at it let's look at it you got two superstars on the team they haven't won 50 games since 2020, which turned out to be the year of the bubble. They haven't won 50 games in the season. The young core in 2017 and 2018 improved by 20 games over two years. That's an average of 10 games a year. So, you know they're going to improve the next year, and you know they're going to continue to improve with that chemistry being developed. You bring in the right star player entering the new decade. You have, you have your assets intact. You have your draft picks intact. This team, instead of winning in the low 40s on average, in the low 40s, missing playoffs, they be winning about 55, 56 games on average. That's how that's how significant this trade-off is. And I, when I say 56, I'm talking about the low end. Because, see, the more value that you – Invest in your players. Well, in turn, you're going to attract the highest value players available because they want to be a part of that. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about in this era of free agency, you know, where where this, this player empowerment. If, I'm saying if they had to play their cards right, it, they, matter of fact, they even had all they had to do was. Don't show your hand. Show your poker face. And I'm telling you, that that young core setting that foundation, it would have drew like a magnet the right players to bring on board, continue to keep this thing going, the, 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 you know, drafting the right players. And, and the Lakers, they still do a great job of drafting when they have an opportunity to draft. That's not even the question. The issue is when you operate in reverse and you try to bring in veterans to replace youth, well, eventually it's going to create a void. And you will fall back in the standings. That is exactly what has happened to this team since 2020. There was no win-now team in the West that finished in the top three seed of the conference. Lakers, Clippers, Phoenix. So the odds are as the youth get more experience in postseason play, why would it change? And that's why you go from 365 days ago, you had all this uh, enthusiasm about a pseudo uh, uh, a young talent being brought in to the reality of what you really got. <laughs> you cannot masquerade. And when it's all said, this is why I speak on this way I do. Because that, that young core was deemed expendable and it's almost like people uh, with influence want to act like they never even existed. But they're the most, they were the most vital parts of the future of this franchise. That's the irony of the whole situation. It's being played out year after year after year after year after year. So now, with the young talent that you brought up in here, the young players you brought up in here, they don't measure up. Well, what other options do they have at this point? Because you can't go back to the, to the, to the big three uh, uh, model, or as they call it model now, a la super team. Because to get a third superstar, you're going to give up about three or four of those players. 
Now you're going to lack the so-called depth that you try to convince yourself that you had, and you're right back at square one, and it's going to look like 2022 all over again. So now that's why I say the Lakers are in, in, a, in, in a flux situation where it's like a dog trying to chase his own tail. The, they will never be able to catch up with what they gave up six times over until they put it into this. And once they come out of this, which is, is going to take a long period of time, when they when they finally move on from this and start over as a franchise, they cannot go down this route again and forego young talent who you spent countless hours scouting to draft. Because in the end, you're only going to sell yourself short. In the end, you're going to fall back in the pack. So I was going to drop that nugget. And until next time, this is JB for BTB. Behind the